Thank you. Thank you so much, Drew and uh, Dr. Slavin and Bernie. Uh, I just, um, it's an honor to speak here, and it's very exciting to be am among everybody here. I'm basically, this has been um, uh, a personal and team journey um, that includes uh, my uh, partners when I first started, Mark Smith, and now Babak Marara, and many, many people here today. Um, so how do I, how do I work a, up a patient with lymphedema? And I think the lymphedema is, lymphedema is evolving, and what I know now is very different than what I know five years ago. And I have a feeling that five years from now, um, we'll look back and uh, wonder why we didn't see what we will see in the future. But basically, what is the pathology we're really dealing with? That, that's, that gives us what our workup is. And I really look at this in three ways. Uh, the lymphatic system itself, the actual lymph component of lymphedema, the, the fat component of lymphedema, which Dr. Borson is going to speak at length on, and then finally the immunologic component of lymphedema, which um, we talk about, we, we mention, but um, oftentimes in surgery, it's not really focused on. But this, after all, is at its core, seems to be an immunologic problem, and it's not a uh, plumbing, uh, purely mechanical problem. The, the fluid accumulates because there's scarring of lymphatics, but why did those lymphatics get scarred in the first place? It wasn't necessarily scarring at the site of lymph node removal, if that's the cause. The scarring's happening um, somewhere else. So this is sort of the invisible elephant in the room. And how do we treat these, these components of lymphedema um, when I'm trying to figure out what's going on? So lymphatic system, the actual lymph can be treated with decongestive physiotherapy and, um, and surgery. The fat can be treated with liposuction or excisional procedures in extreme cases. And more recently, immunotherapy um, is coming into play. Um, um, my, my partner, Dr. Marara, um, is run, runs a lab and basically looking at this, and um, Stan Roxon has um, um, uh, completed his clinical his clinical trial, and these are really exciting uh, parts of the future of lymphedema. So, what are the surgeries that we do, and what kind of surgery are we talking about, and how would we work up somebody for surgery? This includes lymphatic bypass procedures, uh, lymph node transplant. Both of these would take care of the lymph component. And finally, liposuction for the fat component. Uh, many of us combine these procedures to treat the fat component or the fluid component or both. And there's a way we figure out what our patient might have, what their body composition is. But before going even into an imaging workup, um, uh, like Drew said, always asking what the patient's chief complaint is, uh, plain old-fashioned uh, being a doctor. What's really going on here? And one might presume that the, the worse the swelling, the, the more bothered the patient is. But I see patients with almost no swelling, and they be, may be more miserable than patients with quite a lot of swelling. What the patient does, their actual uh, uh, vocation, I'm a surgeon, if I had lymphedema, even if there was no volume difference, if I had to take care of my limb, it would be a career-ending uh, event. Um, so this patient, it's having recurrent cellulitis. This patient is kind of getting by, but just is worried mainly about future progression. What's my leg going to look like in five or 10 years? I can deal with this now, but I, I don't think I could deal with a bigger problem. And this patient um, is really uh, having a difficult time fitting into clothes and doing daily management of the lymphedema. So the bottom line is the, the limb volume, which is always focused on, and we always see the pre- and post-op images, and that's usually an, a main outcome measure, is not the whole story. It's an important part of the story, but it's just one part of the story. Um, all patients are referred, uh, before we consider any surgery, to certified lymphedema therapists we all work closely with, and we also screen patients. Um, in, in, in studying anything carefully, the wider variety of patients you treat, the wider a variety of outcomes you're going to get, and the less likely you are going to answer a question of what you're doing works in a particular group or not. So for those reasons, we have a fairly narrow cutoff of a BMI of 30, and we recommend 
um, with a nutritionist, weight loss um, before surgery. There are also significant risks, risks associated with surgery that if we don't think we're going to give a benefit and expose the patients to things like DVT and pulmonary embolus, these are real, uh, real concerns. Uh, severe venous insufficiency, particularly with lower extremity lymphedema, because main, mainly our, our procedures depend on low venous pressure um, because we're trying to shunt the lymph out into the veins. If the vein has a lot of back pressure, nothing's going anywhere. And uh, also, Drew've already covered um, unrealistic expectations. This is a very humbling field. Um, I make no claims, and I'm always... Um, I always have more questions than answers, but we've had some insights. So what are we measuring? What do we really measure when the patient comes into the office? We're doing all of this now on a prospective IRB protocol. It's on clinicaltrial.gov, basically looking at lymph node transplant um, and quality of life outcomes, as well as volume and all the other stuff. But um, we take the same limb volume measurements with a parameter, as well as using uh, Hakan Brorson's method of a truncated comb, taking four centimeter measurements. And actually, the four centimeter measurements have been the most consistent in, in our experience. Um, we do two different validated quality of life questionnaires, the ULL27 and limb qual for the upper limb, and the LLIS and limb qual for the lower limb. Um, the questionnaires are a little different, and uh, the outcomes may be a bit different. We get bioimpedance, and we take tissue biopsy but these are less, less part of the central core. So how do we approach the imaging workup? Because all those three patients on the outside, right now the current status of, of a lymphedema workup or staging system is purely clinical. You basically do a physical exam and a history and you stage the patient. And that's the way breast cancer was staged about 80 years ago. And there's no way anybody with breast cancer would walk into a room and you do a mastectomy on everybody with breast cancer. Similarly, surgery requires some form of, of imaging below the skin surface. We have to know these patients are not all the same. A, a big arm in one patient and a big arm in another patient may look very different under the skin surface. And again, the treatment has to fit the diagnosis. So we break it down into what's going on with the lymphatic system, what is the fluid to fat ratio or the fat composition in the limb? What is the status of the veins, particularly in the lower extremity? And in some cases, cancer occurrence. We've seen some of these patients presenting with progressive lymphedema, and when we do the MR, we have uncovered some hidden disease. Uh, we do a lot of imaging, and a lot of imaging basically because we want to understand what's going on. So uh, everybody gets preoperatively endocyanine green lymphangiography. We need a shorter word for that. Uh, lymphos, lymphos, which tells us about the lymphatic vessels and actually can see uh, in real time the pumping function. Uh, lymphocentigraphy, which tells us about the function of the lymph nodes. And MRA tells us fat versus fluid, the status of the veins, and, and cancer if there is any. So for the lymph, we're looking at ICG lymphangiography. And um, I think, uh, basically, this tells us the vessels. This tells us the lymph nodes. And ICG lymphangiography is done in our clinic, so this is done in the office through two injections um, with a local anesthetic so it doesn't hurt. Um, and these are, these are the things we get. So it basically tells us, can we do a lymphatic bypass procedure, or are there no lymphatic vessels to bypass? It also helps us decide where to put our lymph nodes. Um, if there's flow above the forearm, we'll put the lymph nodes in the axilla. If things are not getting above the elbow, then we'll likely put our transplant down where the problem is. So the fat component. The fat component, basically, we're looking at the MR. The MR, these are two different patients. This is a leg, a leg, about the same size, but um, black is fluid and white is fat. And you can see this leg is full of fluid and this leg is full of fat. Probably, even if you sucked out all this fluid, the leg is not going to change in volume much. But the patient may have a less heavier leg. They may not need compression as much. I don't know. But these patients may look similarly on the outside, but they are different, very different on the inside, and will likely respond to surgery. So imaging helps us separate our patients and study them better. We've come up with a staging system, a simple staging system, which um, 
should be published soon. But basically, it looks at um, a flu. I'm not going to go into it for purposes of time. But big fluid here is fluid two, where you can see a river. Fluid one is this honeycombing within the fat, and fluid zero is uh, no fluid. Fat zero is no excess fat. Fat one is less than twice the size. Fat two is greater than twice the width of the normal leg. It just gives a simple picture. And we're looking at quantifying all this. That's where everything would lead to. The, the MRA also tells us about the venous system. And in this case, uh, this was a patient Mark Smith and I did together. Um, this patient had a, uh, a cutoff of the axillary vein. This can happen during radiation and scarring, probably in the single digits. Um, but we do see it, and that needs to be, be treated. So where do we get these lymph nodes? Uh, what do we do with all this imaging? And uh, where do we put them? And there are a wide variety of places to put lymph nodes. Um, there, uh, we've done all of these, uh, the supraclavicular, axillary, groin, uh, omentum, and more recently, mesenteric nodes. They all have their pluses and minuses. Uh, some usually peripheral lymph nodes in, in these areas don't don't, um, aren't as invasive. They're all in the fatty tissue layer as opposed to intra-abdominally. Um, and we have minimized the risk of donor site lymphedema using these lymph nodes um, with reverse lymphatic mapping. We've not seen uh, donor site lymphedema in our patients, but this is the topic of um, something we'll talk about a bit later. Um, and, and we've seen this, we've seen that um, after harvesting lymph nodes from these sites with reverse mapping, we can do this actually safely and not only not cause lymphedema, but preserve the drainage to the arm, the drainage to the leg. Um, so these areas don't have a, any risk of donor site lymphedema, um, but they have their own, they have their own potential issues. They have intra-abdominal complications, which you can have, but are, are actually quite low. This is just an example of the kind of lymph node transplants we've done in the past two years. We do omentum a lot these days, but all of these have their place. And where would we put these actual lymph nodes? Proximally or closer to the heart um, is more cosmetic, it's more anatomic. You can remove the scar and decompress the vein, um, and you, it's basically bridging a defect. But it can be challenging in radiation, and is your lymph actually getting up there? Distally or closer to the hand or foot is the most dependent site for gravity, so the idea is that fluid's pooling there. Um, but you may need a skin paddle, especially if you're putting it to wrist or ankle and it doesn't look as good. Um, and then there are other areas in between. So the considerations are basically uh, is there a vein? Is there a problem with the vein? Is there a contracture or range of motion issue? These are other er other problems in addition to lymphedema that could be treated um, by putting the lymph nodes up in the axilla. Um, where does the cellulitis start? If the patient's having the infection in the forearm and, and that's where it always starts, we may consider putting the lymph nodes there. And where does the fluid collect? The closer we look, um, we've actually seen regional patterns of where the fluid's actually collecting and will be. Uh, discussing that. So in a case like this on ICG, where the problem's up here, lymph is getting above the elbow, we'd put this in the axilla. In a case like this, we'd put two lymph node transplants, uh, split the omentum in two, and basically take a piece in the forearm and take the rest and put in the axilla. And you can actually see some of this. Uh, there's a lymph node from the omentum in the forearm, and you can see it on ICG after injecting in the hand. Just a brief case of a patient with secondary lymphedema with dense scar and pitting. Looking beneath the skin surface, you do see nothing's really getting out of the calf. So we're going to put the lymph nodes in the calf. There's a lot of fat here, but there's also a lot of fluid. So I can tell the patient beforehand, we can say, even if the lymph node transplant work, your, your limb will go down, but not all the way. Um, this was an axillary lymph node transplant with reverse mapping to the calf. Um, Mark Smith and I did this uh, years back, and this was her result. And even though I'm showing these pictures, that's sort of tongue in cheek, but the pictures really don't tell the story. The patient's mainly using a lower grade compression garment, and she has a consistent volume reduction. Um, and also on post-op imaging, you can see the fluid has gone down, 
and she has seven lymph nodes light up in her calf. And on lymphocentigraphy, the lymph nodes light up as well, so they're physiologically functioning. I wish this was every patient. It's not every patient. It's not 90% of the patients. I, I think this is more like 50% of the patients. It doesn't mean that only 50% works. Most of our patients, I think, feel that they have a benefit. They're feeling better. But it's, this is a hard and slippery uh, uh, disease to quantify. In conclusion, imaging is important to stratify patients. They're not all the same on the outside. And understanding lymphatic function and the fluid uh, fat composition is key. Thank you so much. Thank you.